Good afternoon everyone, I'm Natalie Morris, the Managing Director of Ubiquity and I'd like to welcome you all to this afternoon's webinar, part of our Generic to Genius webinar series. Throughout this afternoon's webinar, feel free to ask questions, just type them into the box it's on the lower right of your screen and we'll either address those throughout the presentation or at the end uh, we'll have an opportunity for further questions. Just to set the scene, as we all know digital marketing is constantly changing. And to a greater extent, this is actually driven by the change in technologies. Technologies are moving very, very fast, and so consumer behaviour is adapting in response to this. Just to take you back, it was only six years ago that the iPhone was first released, and since then the adoption of smartphones has grown significantly. It was only seven years ago that Facebook was open to non-university students. Digital technologies are transforming the way that we market and one of the key challenges for today's marketers is keeping up with the speed of change. So what's on the minds of the world's marketers and what are the trends that they're looking at at the moment? An annual study by research firm eConsultancy asked client-side marketers to rate the most exciting digital marketing opportunities and we can see them here in the changes between 2012 and 2013. Ubiquity works with New Zealand's leading brands and helps them engage with their customers using data-driven digital marketing. And in my role as MD, I have the pleasure of working with our client organisations across a range of industries. And I can say that what our New Zealand clients are looking at in terms of the priorities and opportunities are very similar to those being seen in this international study. What we thought we'd do today is pick up on three of those key areas of opportunity and look at what that means for um, marketers today. As we're now in quarter three of the year, many of our clients are moving into their planning cycles for 2014. And if you're also in this stage, then over the next 45 minutes we aim to give you some food for thought. We'll be sharing some statistics as well as examples from global brands like McDonald's, Target and Amazon. So let's get started with the first one. Smart use of data will drive the success stories. Consumers are operating in an increasingly cluttered environment. They're bombarded with more and more messages through digital channels and data is a key that allows us to increase engagement and conversion. We can use data to make our messages relevant to the consumer and increase success of campaigns and programs of activity. The beauty of the digital age is that almost every customer action interaction can be captured or is measurable in some shape or form. And what data allows us to do is it allows us to get the right message to people at the right time to personalise, to target and to make sure that we're delivering messages at the right time for an individual consumer. And what we see is companies adopting smarter use of their data, there's going to be a shift towards more frequent, highly targeted campaigns to smaller segments of customers. What I'd like to do now is hand over to my colleague Matt to talk through uh, a couple of case studies and the first one is about a pioneer in data-driven marketing that I'm sure you'll all be familiar with. Uh, thanks for that Natalie and uh, good afternoon everyone. So the first case study that I wanted to take a look at was uh, Amazon.com. Uh, so as we all know Amazon, they're, they're an e-commerce giant. Uh, they're certainly one of the leaders uh, across the globe in terms of an organisation that's taking full advantage of the data that they have available to them. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen this type of program in action if you've browsed or bought anything online from Amazon or any of the other sort of large commerce sites. I guess just to, to illustrate the type of thing that can be achieved if you have this, the luxury I suppose of this rich data available to you, uh, I'd like to do through an example of a, a typical basket chaser type program that they run. So within this example that I'll show you through, uh, an Amazon customer has browsed for a, a specific digital camera, um, they've added some products to their basket uh, and then abandoned their cart and left the site. So Amazon have identified that this type of behaviour, this, this prospect obviously yeah, represents a really hot prospect in their eyes and so they've got a number of different automated uh, data driven uh, email chaser campaigns and so this is just an example of one of those. So the following day uh, the customer receives the email you can see here uh, in their inbox and so the content of the email is positioned as you know, customers who have shown interest in point and shoot cameras might like to also take a look at this week's best selling models. 
So first and foremost, you can see this is a highly relevant targeted email sent to the customer at a point that they're likely to still, I guess, be considering purchasing. Um, and this type of program, it isn't just leveraging my past browsing history, so it's not just taking a look at what I've browsed on the website. It also takes into account how I'm interacting with the email program itself. So based on the fact that I've received two emails from Amazon about cameras, I've opened both of them, I've clicked on some products in the email, uh, Amazon can make a reasonable assumption that I'm still a hot prospect in the market for a camera. So I mean, had I not engaged with these previous emails, uh, then Amazon would have stopped contacting me or stopped sending emails out, uh, as that would obviously lead, I'm obviously not interested, and that can lead to me becoming, I guess, more annoyed more than anything. So, but given I've shown interest, uh, it's worth the gamble to keep sending out this, uh, keep sending me emails regarding cameras. So, given my interest, there's a there's a variety of other different emails that they've actually sent through. So you can see we've got uh, cameras of a different brand, uh, deal of the day type emails, which just so happen to be uh, point and shoot digital camera. Uh, and I mean, throughout the campaign, based on how I'm interacting with these comms, um, I continue to receive further follow-up communications. So the remaining uh, components of the program, they included uh, most popular similar products, uh, holiday specific or promotional offers, or cross-sale package offers where they're, they're offering tripods or other things to complement cameras. Uh, so I mean, I guess the key takeaway here with this type of program is, yes, uh, this is definitely uh, very contact heavy, uh, I guess by typical standards anyway, but uh, because it's so highly targeted and it's so relevant to potential customers, because I'm, you know, I'm obviously in the market. I'm looking, I'm looking for cameras. So I'm genuinely interested in what Amazon is sending me. Um, you know, then me as a consumer, I, I don't mind being contacted about that. Uh, and I mean, given that I'm likely to only be in the market for a short period of time, um, then why not send out useful, relevant content to me? Um, you know, that's going to help me make an, an informed purchase decision. Uh, so just moving on to, a, to another case study that I want to show you through, uh, it's a bit of a contrast I suppose to Amazon.com uh, and it, it goes to show that you don't always need uh, vast amounts of rich data in order to create a personalized experience. Uh, Amazon obviously have a wealth of information about their customers and what they're looking at, whereas for the vast majority of marketers out there, you might not necessarily have that volume of rich information at your fingertips. Uh, yeah, within this study, as you'll see, is it's, it's not always about having vast amounts of data. It's about taking what little information you have, and I guess it's about the smart application using that data that you have to deliver something great. Uh, so this is an example. This is Air New Zealand over in the UK, uh, and the campaign itself is called Personalized Cloud. Uh, it was aimed at injecting some life and soul into what would otherwise be a boring itinerary type like service uh, communication. Uh, it was aimed at giving customers a more personalized experience. So it, it consists of pre-flight and post-arrival emails to passengers containing specific information about their flight and the destination that they're traveling to. So if you think about the information that uh, Air New Zealand had available to them, um, they would have known, I guess, the contact details, but was um, what my age was, uh, those typical type things which we would quite commonly have. But they also knew the, the key stats, I suppose, that they had was they knew uh, when I was going to travel and knew where I was traveling to. So they really thought long and hard about how best to use this information and came up with a great email, as you can see here. So it was delivered to customers two days before their travel date. Uh, so immediately that's uh, being delivered at a relevant time where I'm going to be really excited about you know, traveling overseas. Um, and I'm going to be you know, interested in what Air New Zealand have to say. Uh, they've also included, as you can see there on the right hand side, a, uh, a destination top tip. And so this is a personalized uh, piece of content um, which is specific to where I'm traveling. Uh, probably the, the best touch that they made in my eyes anyway is the, if you can see the lady on the left down there, that's actually an image of the flight attendant 
is going to be working on my flight uh, when I go on board this aircraft. Uh, so it's, I guess it's a, it's a really good way of, um, of personalizing that. Uh, and you can see there, they've also included um, a weather forecast for the next five days um, from the destination of where I'm traveling to. So you can see that from uh, what little information they knew about me, uh, they've really thought about how they can use this uh, and they've translated it into something personalized and really useful uh, for their customers. The campaign itself, uh, it's proven an outstanding success. Uh, they've had feedback from customers who were just amazed that the person welcoming them on the plane was actually the same person that was waving out to them from the initial email. Uh, so yeah, I just think it's a great example. It just shows you that even with a little bit of information that you have, um, you can still deliver something great. So I think that's probably enough from me for a while, Nat. I'll hand it back over to you. Thanks, Matt. Um, I think one of the things that Matt's alluded to is that data does present a challenge. And if you're thinking, gosh, it's all very well for these organisations like Amazon and in New Zealand to be doing this kind of data-driven marketing, how can that relate to me? Um, I have, you know, uh, resource challenges um, and it's hard. But I think it would be fair to say that it's a challenge that Mark is right across the globe is struggling with in terms of all of the data that is available, how can they best make use of it? And we can see that the uh, majority of organisations still see big gaps and opportunities in their ability to actually uh, utilise data. And there's two sides to it. You've, you've got to look at collecting the data and then on the other hand also how you're going to make effective use of it uh, because one without the other uh, is not going to deliver benefits. I guess the message I would, I would have for you is don't be overwhelmed by it. If you don't know where to start, start small and look at the data that you do have, at how you can use it as per the Air uh, New Zealand example. What can you do with the data that you do have? And you can then build your efforts over time. Start targeting and personalising with a few segments and use that as a test and learn strategy. Use it to justify uh, and measure return on investment and justify further investment in your data-driven marketing strategies. Some of the ways that uh, we see clients uh, adapting to constraints that they have um, is looking at how they can actually gather more information from customers. So even if you have a very small amount of information, uh, consider how you could go back to your customers and prospects and actually get more information from them that will actually help you to deliver personalised and relevant communications. A really great example that we've seen recently in the New Zealand market is sleepyhead beds. And some of you may be familiar with this. It's been quite heavily promoted. And what they're looking at here is they're looking at gathering information on prospects um, through means of a bed selector. So you can go online and tell them uh, some information about your current bed, who the bed is for, what is your preferred sleeping position, a whole lot of different information. And at the end of it, it will actually spit out a recommendation on the best bed for you. So this provides a real useful uh, set of information um, to the marketers who can then target communications to you based on all the information that they found out about you. They can target specific beds to you, they can tell you when there are offers on those specific beds, but they also understand more about uh, the type of uh, family situation you might be in and other beds that you might be interested in in the future. So it gives a lot of useful information to the marketers, but instead of actually having asked this in a very boring form where we ask you know, all sorts of questions about the bed, it's done in an engaging format and at the end of it there's some useful results that are spit out for the uh, end prospect uh, where they're actually given a recommendation about the bed and information about where they can buy the bed and then that's complemented with information about you know, how to choose a bed and those types of things. So, that's an example of uh, looking at how you can actually gain information from the prospects or customers, starting from a position of having no information and gather really rich data which then sets you up for being able to use that on an ongoing basis. Other things to think about are transactional data. Some organisations like these ones here that we see on screen uh, have the ability to target very, very closely based on a full transactional history. Um, and that's something that uh, is becoming easier. Some of the things, some of the advancements in technology that we see have made it easier for things that historically 
perhaps larger organisations have been able to do but have been harder for smaller organisations with fewer resources to do are now becoming much more accessible as technologies improve. And so being able to actually cross-reference data from your transactional systems back into your marketing database is now becoming much more uh, accessible. A couple of other examples that I thought uh, provide great case studies. If you're a member of LinkedIn, you're probably familiar with the streams and streams of emails that you get from them on a, on a daily or weekly basis. But this is one that I think really demonstrates how personalization can cut through that because this is a very highly personalized email that's based on my particular contacts. But furthermore, it's not just copy, it's very, very visual. So suddenly I'm confronted with an email that's got all of these faces that I recognize and it's very, very compelling. Uh, so it's a great example of using, uh, of the power of using personalized data to actually uh, deliver relevance and really cut through that clutter. Uh, Microsoft also uh, with Xbox Live, here's an example of an email that they send out where they've personalized the email based on information about how you've actually been interacting with Xbox Live. And in this they compare your stats with um, worldwide usage statistics to create some interesting personalized content around that. One of the things you want to think about though when you're doing personalization is uh, how to make sure that it is actually going to work well in all scenarios. In this example, a bit of a pitfall, um, a fairly underwhelming statistic for this particular player who's uh, accumulated only one hour of multiplayer time. So it's worth thinking about uh, how you can do this well and thinking about the full range of different possibilities when you're doing data-driven marketing so that it doesn't go bad. And I'm going to hand you back to Matt for another case study around where good data goes bad. Thanks again, Nelly, for that. So, yeah, the next uh, case study I'd like to take you all through uh, this afternoon uh, is uh, a story from Targa over in the States. So, uh, if you think about it, every time that we're out there and we're shopping, you're sharing some quite intimate details about your consumption patterns with retailers. And the smart businesses, uh, they're listening, you know, they're out there, they're taking notice. Uh, if they can start tracking purchase patterns, then they can start predicting what you might need next. Uh, and then if they know what you need next, then they can get an offer in front of you which might you know, entice you to make additional subsequent purchases. Um, so they get this happening before, you know, sometimes before you even know that you want it. So Target themselves I think are up there with the best, uh, best of them in terms of data mining. Uh, they've been collecting and analyzing data literally for decades uh, and they've got really, really good at it too. Uh, there's a lot of talk out there that uh, data analysts are the next rock stars uh, and they are in hot demand out there from a lot of these big businesses. Uh, so I mean, yeah, these analysts, they can, they can wade through the masses of data, make connections, identify patterns and then ultimately these can be translated into something valuable and use, uh, useful that the, the business can actually use to do something with. So uh, again, it's not just about collecting the information because you can have uh, you know, as much data or information as you like. It's useless unless you are actually making smart use of this information. So uh, this is quite a popular story. I'm sure some of you may have heard of this already, but for those who haven't, um, I, I think it's worth revisiting. Uh, yeah, I think it's the nerd in me coming out here, but I just find this uh, absolutely fascinating. So the story goes that uh, an angry father storms up to a local store, a uh, local Target store, sorry, over in America and demands to speak with the manager. Uh, he weighs around these coupons for nappies and says, I just got these coupons in the mail. You know, what are you doing? Are you trying to encourage her to get pregnant? And so these, these vouchers, they're, um, they're for uh, an offer, a discount off nappies. Uh, and so the, the manager is completely bewildered, he's sitting there, he doesn't know what's going on uh, and so he reassures the customer and just apologizes profusely for the mix up and uh, sends the disgruntled father on his way. So uh, a couple of days later though, the, the manager is still feeling pretty bad about the situation um, so he calls up the father again to further apologize. Uh, and so the, the conversation rolls on and uh, he apologizes and says, look, I'm really sorry, um, I don't know what the mix-up was, that's not what we're trying to do at all. Uh, and then the father 
kids, and he says, "Oh, well, actually, I've uh, I've had a little chat with with uh, my daughter, and she's not been quite as well behaved uh, as I thought." Uh, and it actually turned out that she was due six months later, so she was in fact pregnant, and Target had uh, got it right. So uh, I guess just the, the backstory behind this is what I find particularly interesting. Um, apparently, a, a very large percentage of all of our purchase decisions um, they're based on habitual patterns. So you know, you buy a milk from your local grocery store, you shop, uh, you shop for your favourite clothes at you know the same place, uh, and these habitual patterns they're they're notoriously hard to change, and so that presented a real challenge for Target because uh, they I guess are a, a classic example of the ultimate one stop shop. So I mean they sell everything, they sell milk, they sell nappies, they sell clothes, they sell juice, they sell lawn mowers, you name it, they, they sell it. Uh, but historically, I guess customers never would consider Target to source all of their necessities from the one store. And so obviously Target, what they wanted to do was they wanted everyone to come into their store and buy everything that they ever needed from Target. So however, uh, there are certain periods in your life where these habitual patterns are susceptible to change. And chief among these is during pregnancy or uh, when you start a new family. And so I guess from a, a marketing perspective, these customers, they really represent the holy grail um, to retailers. So uh, marketers cottoned onto this pretty quickly uh, and eventually they were trolling birth records over the country and targeting new families as soon as these, uh, as these details were made public. So. Target thought, well, uh, you know, we don't want to, um, we don't want to have to fight uh, with everyone else. What we want to do is we want to go one step back. We want to, we want to get these, uh, we want to get these people before, um, you know, before they actually have their child, uh, and so that way they could get to the, these uh, soon-to-be mothers before anyone else could. Uh, so they knew if they could identify that these women in their second trimester, there's a good chance that they could capture them for years. Uh, marketers want to start getting specially designed ads in front of these women at that specific point in time. So these data rock stars, they went away and they started working their magic on the data, waving their wand around or whatever it is that they actually do to make sense of it all. And they were able to look, oh, the way that they did it, they were able to look at customers that um, had a baby register at Target stores. And so they were obviously customers who were in fact pregnant or had recently had a child. Um, and then what they did was they worked backwards from that point. So they looked at what did these people purchase leading up, up you know, six months, 12 months before that. And so eventually they identified some clear patterns in purchase history and came up with a method of assigning like a, a baby score to all women who walk through the door. So for example, they noticed that pregnant women in their second trimester tend to buy large quantities of unscented lotion and supplements. So now a lot of people buy lotion, but if you start suddenly buying a lot of unscented lotion and a large purse that can double as a nappy bag, then it starts to become more likely that you are uh, perhaps pregnant. And so what they've actually put in place is based on what you purchase, uh, you're given a, like a, a baby score. And once this exceeds a certain level, um, then they're fairly confident that you are in fact pregnant. Uh, and they will send you specific offers relating to your pregnancy. Uh, so as you can see from what I was talking about earlier, they, they got pretty, pretty good at predicting these pregnancies. And you know, I, I, I think it's a little bit scary really. Uh, from a consumer perspective, I think it's uh, important to consider that you know, this is very close to overstepping the line in terms of you know, what is useful to customers and what can quite quickly become creepy in the consumer's mind. Uh, so, following on from this target, uh, they've, you know, as the public became aware of this, since adapted their strategies, and what they actually do now is they'll include false positives in the campaign or the mailings that they send out. So even if they identify a, um, you know, a customer that may be pregnant, when they send out these targeted offers offers to them, um, they'll also include a lot of other unrelated uh, products in there as well. So 
what that does is that creates, I guess, an, an illusion that uh, these offers are random, but in actual fact, uh, they do know exactly what what you want. So yeah, I, I just think that's a fascinating case study, um, and just goes to show what you can do when you do have all of that rich information um, available to you. So I'll uh, hand you back over now to Nat. To I think that's a, f a very interesting debate about when good uh, data becomes creepy, and I think we all have examples of where we've, we think that uh, organisations that we've been dealing with from a consumer perspective have actually overstepped the mark and gone from being clever to being creepy. It is a very fine line and uh, I find that talking about that with, with my colleagues, we come up with really interesting examples and it's a very good way of actually testing how consumers will feel about things that we're potentially looking at doing with data. But now moving on to the second trend that we wanted to talk about, and this is around the uh, mobile usage and how that's shaping uh, consumer behaviour change. So I started by talking about how quickly technology is changing, and one of the key changes that we've seen over the last um, number of years has been the rise of the smartphone and other mobile devices for using, uh, for interacting with the online environment. And as the penetration of smartphones continues to grow, this is becoming increasingly important. And what we've seen over the last 12 to 18 months is a real change in how marketers have had to adapt to that, the way that consumers are using mobile. Probably 18 months ago, if you talked about uh, interactions with a mobile device, a lot of marketers would have still been in the headspace of thinking about apps and thinking about how they could use apps within their marketing. But that's really changed and now there's a lot more consideration of other, other um, ways that consumers are interacting with mobile, in particular the mobile web, um, but also with email. What we know is that the amount of time spent with mobile is growing very, very rapidly and is going to continue to grow. And it's not just the amount of time spent on mobile that's important, it's also the growing range of activities that consumers are undertaking. So they're not just reading emails on their phones, they're searching for things, they're researching products, and they're actually buying things online. And there's a progression towards the constantly con connected consumer. And this is something we need to think about when we're planning uh, our marketing programs and campaigns. In terms of smartphone penetration, uh, by 2012 in New Zealand it was already sitting at 44% um, and that has continued to grow driven by the increased availability of lower cost smartphone handsets as well as a perceived decrease in the price of data. In terms of what people are doing on their phones, um, email is the most popular activity for people uh, on their smartphone and we can see that uh, in 2012, 71% of smartphone owners had used their phones for sending or reading email. We actually track the proportion of emails that are read on smartphones and other mobile devices. And what you can see here is that there's been a significant increase. It's more than doubled over the last 18 months. So we're now sitting on average, um, about 22% of emails will actually be read first on a smartphone. And that of course can differ very significantly depending on the demographic that we're talking about. So in terms of adapting to that, if you are doing any email marketing as part of your um, communications program, um, one of the things to think about is how you can actually adapt your emails for that online environment. You might be familiar with the concept of responsive design for websites, um, but one of the things that uh, a lot of clients of ours are now starting to look at is creating responsive design for emails. So here's an example of an email as it might look on a desktop. And you can imagine, and you probably experience this quite a lot, where you get emails that are designed for desktop on your smartphone. The fonts are very small, you have to pinch and zoom um, to actually be able to interact with the content. So as a consumer, you're being asked to work really hard to actually um, even be able to uh, take in that content. What you can do is you can actually adapt the email um, so that it will automatically, depending on the device that it's opened on, um, adapt the way that it displays. So the example on the right shows how this email will display if it's opened on a smartphone. And so the type of things that you can see there is that it's been adapted into a single column layout. The font's larger so the consumer can actually 
uh, read the content without having to pinch and zoom. We've got finger-friendly buttons. Um, the other thing that uh, has been done in this email is that what we know is when consumers are interacting with emails on their mobile devices, they're actually more likely to be out and about. People no longer actually sit down in front of their uh, at a desk in front of their computer to interact with emails or to interact with the web. When they're on a mobile device, they be anywhere, they're out and about. They might be um, you know, watching the, the, the kids' sports practice, um, they might be uh, waiting for their meeting to start, and so they're really highly distracted. So one of the things that's been done in this email is that we've actually reduced the amount of content. So the, um, the, uh, the third row in, in the desktop version of content has actually been um, left out of the mobile version so that there's less to distract the consumer. It's not just email that people are doing, uh, searching and browsing online are also very close and in fact purchasing online, although there are inherent difficulties in actually going through a purchase process on a mobile device, people are doing it and 29% uh, of smartphone owners had in fact uh, purchased a product or service on their mobile. So with this change in consumer behaviour actually comes a change in consumer expectations. People are now doing things on their mobile and so they're expecting to be able to do them on their mobile. And what this means is that if you don't optimise, the penalty becomes greater. Uh, a report out of the States in 2013 said that 80% of consumers would delete an email without, um, if, it, if it wasn't mobile optimised and wasn't easy to interact with without reading it. And so those kind of figures show us the need to actually be adapting what we're doing. We also performed a, an admittedly completely unscientific piece of research um, at a, a recent uh, marketing association event where we asked an audience of marketers to tell us how they behaved when they visited uh, uh, websites that weren't optimised for mobile. So we asked them, last time you used your phone to visit a website and discovered it wasn't optimised, did you abandon the site or persevere, zoom and squint? And we were expecting actually that there would be an easy win for option A abandonment. But in fact, of the uh, around 150 uh, people who uh, responded to the poll, just 30% reported that they'd exit sites that provided a poor experience and incredibly 70% would persevere anyway. So we were really intrigued by this and drilling down further into the results, what we found was that the reason why people were sticking around was because they actually needed the information. It was the only available source and they needed it quickly. So essentially, what we were doing to these uh, consumers was that we were holding them hostage. They want mobile freedoms, so they had to reluctantly put up with a poor user experience. And I think this demonstrates the need to actually start doing a better job when consumers are having uh, such poor experiences that they're reporting. So mobile optimization, how should we interpret this? Well, mobile optimization is increasingly critical. Um, consumers can easily move on to a site that supports a better user experience. And we need to actually improve what we're doing. Another study has shown that where a site is mobile friendly, people are 67% more likely to buy. And conversely, if it's unfriendly, they're 61% more likely to move away to another site. And I think it's really worth acknowledging that in the online world, it's very easy for people to move away to somewhere else and perhaps to your competitors' sites. We're also in a, in a uh, global uh, environment where if they can't get what they want from you, it's likely that there may be a global competitor that they can go to who's doing a better job. And that's just the, the reality of the global environment that we operate within. So if you're not already f uh, looking at how you optimise your website, and further than that, not just your website, but also all of your digital marketing campaigns to ensure that they work really well on mobile, you're going to be missing a, you're going to be missing a trick and your competitors are uh, have a way that they can actually get ahead of you. And finally, we'd like to move on to the last trend to talk about, and that is content marketing. And consumers have, are starting to shut off from the traditional world of marketing. They've got a recorder which allows them to skip television advertising. They've become adept at surfing so they can take in online information without noticing ads. And Marketers are understanding that traditional marketing is becoming less and less effective and this is where content marketing comes in. So how does content marketing play a part? 
Well, here's a definition of content marketing. Your customers don't care about you, your products, your services. They care about themselves, their wants and their needs. Content marketing is about creating interesting information your customers are passionate about so they actually pay attention to you. So it's a move away um, from promoting information uh, to promoting and move to promoting information from promoting the, com uh, the company itself. The important thing here is to think about relevance and think about what's in it for me uh, from a customer's perspective and that's what content marketing delivers. Content marketing is used at all parts of the customer life cycle and there are different strategies that are appropriate for different uh, purposes. So if you're looking at lead generation, you may then employ different content marketing strategies to brand. The most commonly used content marketing channels for delivery are the things that we would traditionally think about in the digital world like blogs and email newsletters and they are definitely remaining prominent but there's also a move now towards other delivery platforms to increase the reach of content. And social channels provide a perfect vehicle to amplify content reach and return on investment. And they also al uh, allow an open dialogue between the customer and the brand for organisations that are prepared to open up and really be authentic in the way that they deal with customers. I think it would be fair to say that customers are increasingly cynical and so that authenticity becomes very important. So I'm now going to uh, once again hand back to Matt to take you through um, a case study in this area. Just to, I guess, to, to bring to life uh, what Matt's been discussing here, I'd like to share with you um, what I think is one of the best executions uh, of an awesome content marketing strategy that I've come across. So uh, this is from uh, McDonald's over in Canada. Uh, and McDonald's, as we all know, uh, They've had a bit of a battle with public perception over the quality of their products and the subsequent health impl implications of you know um, eating the food itself. So we all know that there's a lot of deep-seated sort of urban myths out there about you know what McDonald's actually put in their food. So I know for a fact that when I was younger, I uh, it's a little bit embarrassing, but I used to believe that they actually injected pig fat into their thick shakes. So I hope this is complete rubbish, but I guess that just highlights um, the fact that there's a lot of the, these kind of preconceptions um, out there. So in order to try and address some of these issues, um, rather than a, I guess a typical approach, we might try and push a message out to the public, you know, with an advertising campaign about you know we only use 100% real beef in our burgers and um, send that out through the traditional means. Um, well, they, they, they really flipped this thinking, I suppose, on its head um, and took a gamble to go out to the public and get them to ask the questions that they wanted to know. So they actually went out and asked the public, you know, what, what do you want to know about our products? You know, what, what do you have a problem with? Um, and then McDonald's in turn would tackle these questions head on. So I, I guess McDonald's being one of the world's biggest brands, I think they really threw their hat into the ring here with this one. Uh, Essentially, they gave the power of the campaign over to the people most likely to question it and challenge it. So I think it also demonstrates that uh, the consumers are beginning to expect uh, to be able to interact directly with brands nowadays. So it's no longer just a one-way street. Uh, consumers expect to be able to have like a, a conversation with a brand, uh, particularly uh, in the digital space. In a nutshell, the way that this particular campaign worked was that anyone could visit this website. Uh, they had to log in via um, their social media account um, and they could post a question directly to McDonald's. So they could ask anything they wanted and McDonald's would then go away and formulate a response to these questions. So the public, they could, they could follow certain different questions uh, and they're encouraged to share this content uh, to their social networks. Um, and sometimes the answer was just a, a simple written response or an answer to that question. Um, but for the more sticky questions, uh, McDonald's, what they did was they, they really seized this opportunity and they created some rich video content um, around the topic of the question um, and really wanted to, I guess, leverage the opportunity to address these uh, deep-seated misconceptions that they're trying to overcome. But I, I think the reason why I find this campaign so interesting is the fact that it would is the public that essentially gave McDonald's the key questions or the, the key content to work with. Uh, and then based on what the public was asking, then McDonald's could then generate more content in response to these questions. 
as more questions um, were answered, then that subsequently created more interest, and that resulted in more questions, and then subsequently, obviously, more content. So I guess it's, it's, it's like a snowball effect, almost. Um, and the campaign itself, uh, as it progressed and it grew, uh, it just essentially became like a content generating machine. Uh, and because it was all around, you know, the questions that the public wanted to know, I think it was really successful and engaging content that people were more likely to share. So it's important to note as well that uh, throughout the whole campaign that McDonald's weren't trying to sell anything at all. Um, everything was focused solely on sharing or publishing with this, this rich information to the public. Um, and yeah, they weren't trying to push any any products or anything uh, onto consumers. The questions that some of the public were asking, they're, they're quite full on. Uh, like, you know, why does it take unnaturally long for your food to spoil? Or, you know, how much kangaroo meat is in each burger? Uh, so, I mean, overall, I think McDonald's were extremely transparent uh, in their responses. So instead of keeping the tough questions hidden away, uh, they essentially made them louder. Uh, the thinking there was that, you know, if they were open and they were upfront uh, as possible in their answers, then this would hopefully have the greatest impact on changing consumer preconceptions about their brand and their products. Uh, the, the campaign results, uh, I think, speak for themselves. Really, it was obviously a, a, a great success. Um, and again, I think the key to this success is really around the quality of the content itself. Um, it was the information that the public was genuinely interested in, uh, and so this then leads to the content being amplified across social networks and other online channels. Uh, so I mean, you just have to think that we're sitting here on the other side of the world um, speaking about this particular campaign, which is, I think, a, a credit to its success. Uh, so. If you, if you haven't checked out this website yet, uh, it's definitely worth a visit, um, so we'll include the, uh, the link in the, the slide share that gets um, shared around at the conclusion of the webinar. Uh, and one other example as well, which uh, was actually fairly recent, this was, this was last night, and I think it's uh, quite relevant here as well. So this was, the, the CEO of Z uh, last night was available on Facebook, um, and so you could actually log in uh, similar, I guess, uh, to the McDonald's campaign, you could log in and ask them any question that you wanted, and the CEO would sit there and respond to you. Uh, so, I mean, they can ask anything. I can see there that uh, you know they're asking questions about how much profit they're making on fuel, um, all the way through to you know why don't they stop? Why don't they have more cheese in their pies or something quite silly like that? But you know they were there and they were answering the questions, um, and I think it really highlights that. Uh, this is the way that we're moving towards. Like, uh, consumers are actively willing to have this conversation uh, with uh, brands. So, uh, if anything, this type of um, interaction or this type of program, I think, is going to become more prevalent in the time to come. So, uh, that's probably it from me. I'll, I'll hand back over to you, Natalie, to sum up. Thanks, Matt. I think the key there is that as consumers become more cynical about marketing messages, um, the, the real need there is to give them content that's of value, but also be authentic in the way that you deal with them and uh, be making sure that there is real authenticity in the, those interactions because they can see through it if there isn't that level of authenticity. So I hope in the last 45 minutes we've uh, been able to give you some food for thought, uh, whether you're at the stage of planning for next year or whether you're reviewing what you've done so far this year. So just to recap uh, so the three big trends that we've seen over the last 12 months. Firstly, uh, a continual move towards the smarter use of data. Um, and I just remind you of the advice not to be overwhelmed by it. Take small bites of the elephant and look at what you do have, look at what you can do and develop that incrementally. You don't need to be an Amazon, but you can certainly start getting there and being more relevant to the consumers that you're trying to reach. The second point, mobile usage, um, that's just going to continue to increase.
increase. So all of our digital marketing campaigns and programs are going to have to take into account the constantly connected consumer, the consumer who's out and about when they're interacting with our website or with our marketing program. Um, and that should really be at uh, the forefront of consideration with any campaign that you're running. And finally, uh, looking at content and looking at how you can actually use digital channels to disseminate content that is relevant and valuable to consumers uh, as a way of uh, engaging with them in, a, in an authentic way. I'd like to thank you all for coming. Uh, we're going to close there. If anybody has any questions, then Matt and I will uh, stay behind uh, until 2 o'clock to answer those, so just feel free to send those through. Um, we'd love to have your feedback on the webinar, so um, please make sure that you do send through any feedback to us. Hope you have a lovely afternoon. Thanks very much.